Greetings, everybody. I'm Professor Guy McPherson of the Nature Bats Last channel, and I'm here with psychologist Peter Miller, and we're going to continue our conversations for the third or fourth time within the last month or so. We'll be taking a break next week because at least one of us, that's me, will be going camping with friends on the coast of Maine, and as we've talked about in our conversations here, there are few things far, far there are few things more important than having decent relationships with people. And I've gone camping a few thousand times. I'm not nearly as excited about it as the other three people who will be involved. But whatever, <laughs> relationships are important. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to you, Peter, so you can get us started on a conversation, maybe open up a topic or whatever. Sure. So yeah, we were recently pondering uh, some of the things people might experience when they're ex exploring NTHE, near-term human extinction. Um, it is, I guess, a little bit fringe topic, right? Um, and uh, But nonetheless, very intriguing, interesting. And um, it's loaded with uh, uh, things you can learn about science um, and from other professionals uh, like Guy and e Ecologist, among other titles, right? Um, and uh, so, I mean, I started down that path about uh, uh, five years ago, and I found it immediately intriguing from reading his book, Going Dark and then Going Further. Um, but what you will find out once you kind of start exploring these things, that if you want to talk about them in the people in your midst, you may come up with uh, some, you may come, uh, you may experience some resistance from people because it is, it can be, I guess, uh, controversial. It can be emotionally charged in a way. Um I think it actually goes right to the core of some of our humanness where people often don't want to go. And I mean, my experiences as a therapist speak volumes of that to me, like working with people, people will just, they don't want to go there because it's, it can be uh, challenging in, in several respects. You mean to really, to deeply self-reflect, right? And go, who am I? Who are we as a, you know, as a family or who are we as a community? Who are we as a, a global community? Uh, I don't think people think that broadly most of the time. So like what Guy has done with his work is kind of go, let's go deep and wide, right? And let's see what, uh, where this takes us. And that's, I think it's a lot more than just exploring the environmental aspects. Like it cuts to the core of human existence, really. Um, and one of um, one of Guy's viewers had a, a question about how to deal with that when the people around you, I guess, want to stay in their bubble or in their in their um, silo, whatever you will. Um, so I think we should talk about this. Um, I've had experiences like that uh, with the people around me, and I've kind of learned that there aren't very many people at all that I can actually comfortably talk about this with and it's one of the reasons I really enjoy talking to Guy and I think other people like watching these videos as well it's because like well we can finally talk about some of these things openly without someone trying to invalidate or dismiss or uh, kind of call it crazy we can actually talk openly so I mean and obviously Guy you've experienced this on multiple occasions with maybe hundreds or thousands of people I don't know maybe you could speak well, to that for a few minutes yeah, it certainly is controversial. I mean, to the point that almost nobody believes that it can ha actually happen, that we could actually go extinct. I mean, look how clever we are as individuals and as a species. We have we've changed the world in many ways. As a species, we have become the apex predator. We have destroyed so many things. We have built incredible works of architecture and works of art. So the the thought that a species as clever as ours could go extinct 
is just beyond the ability of most people to handle. I might have talked about this before, but an example of how quickly a species can go extinct is the San Benedicto rock wren, which was a relatively small bird on the San Benedicto Island off the Pacific coast of Mexico. On August 1st, 1952, the island became volcanic. It blew up. Bird watchers, or as they call themselves birders, just to save a syllable, spend an enormous amount of time tracking unusual birds. And this bird was never seen again. There were a bunch of islands in an island chain within flying distance. The mainland was in flying distance. And obviously, some individuals of that species tried to find habitat, tried to find some other place to go just as we all would, just as the drive to maintain our own lives applies to non-human organisms as well. So this bird went extinct within hours, days, weeks, we don't know, but a very short period of time because it lost habitat and there was no other habitat remaining for it. So I think pondering the idea of near-term human extinction Okay, even if it's not true, let's say that I made up the whole thing just for, for sport, just so that I could ruin my life. I made up the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just a big joke from me to you. Even if, even if that's the case, but you haven't accepted that yet, even if it's the case that it's a big joke, if you accept it, even for a few minutes, it tells you a lot about who you are. If we only have a relatively finite amount of time to live and we all do by the way even without near-term human extinction even if we have a relatively short period during which our lives how are we going to spend it if you live to be 50 or 60 or 80 i don't think anybody would argue that at the end of their life that was way too long right i mean when i was touring Western Europe in 2015, there was a woman who turned 117 years old. And at her 117th birthday party, she was asked to ponder those first 117 years of her life. And she said, it seemed rather short. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. she died a few weeks later, mm. 117 years old, and it seemed rather short. And I don't think any of us probably seriously consider our lives being too long i mean i've been out working today stacking firewood and sweating like crazy and it's hard for me some days to amorfati to love my fate but still i'd much rather be alive and experiencing the terrors of pounding in tea posts to hold up the firewood and carrying the firewood, putting in a wheelbarrow back and forth 900 times, blah, 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 so that I might enjoy even more comfort this winter. And mm -hmm. Peter, you know about winters oh. in Canada. And I know about winters. I grew up in Northern Idaho and now I'm in Vermont where it's, it's a little chilly. So mm -hmm. I yeah, think, the... go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, the winters, I mean, here can be sometimes extreme. And although they have seemed somewhat more mild or, and less um, and uh, not as long in recent years. Um, yeah, but I mean, of course, the great white north, right? That's what we're known for. Uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie and snow, right? Right. <laughs> and other things, it's maple syrup, stuff like that. Um, but um, I mean, I was uh, really pondering this and as I was kind of meditating this morning and I read a bit of some of my psychology books and um, I was like so I was wondering how do we split into like political camps and different worldviews you know like and stuff like that and because obviously I'm more of a lefty type and I, I have come up with lots of reasons sort of to despise the right uh, wing way of thinking um, but um I mean, I think, uh, like, if you're interested in this subject, I have to assume that most people would be more on the left side of the spectrum because they would be more interested in 
community rather than individualism. They would be they would be interested in sustainability and and making sure that we can that future generations won't go without. So we're not it's not just short term um, thinking. Um, it's more like um, it's yeah it's more cooperative and um, not just so individualistic. And I, I'm I'm pretty sure most people on the, on the right, if you're leaning that way, you're more like well. It's just about me and my life and my family and what I can get while while I'm here. Very short term, short, short sighted, I would say. Right, collect as much wealth as I can while I'm here. Um, right, and then pass yeah. it along to my children and grandchildren. And then yeah, so they get that inherited wealth, which yeah, which is another kind of gross concept, I think. But um, so. I mean, if you're gravitating towards this kind of subject and you like pondering these ideas, um, I think we're trying to go as far down that that type of rabbit hole as possible. Um, or I don't even know, ra rabbit hole kind of has a negative connotation, more area of inquiry. I think it's an area of scientific inquiry myself and 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 political and humanistic existential, all of that combined, which kind of makes it extra interesting. <laughs> so, I mean you might be realizing that you might be one of the different types in the people around you. Like you might be more of a left-wing kind of thinker or more of a long-sighted than short-sighted kind of thinker. Um, and I don't know if we totally have 100% choice in that matter because I knew like in grade seven, grade eight, that I, I knew something wasn't right, <laughs> like with the way the world was. And there was lots of dysfunction that we were having to um, cope with. And that the, the environment was just getting pillaged. Like, I just kind of knew it, but I couldn't put it all together, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, most of us approximately our age have seen <clears throat> the living planet destroyed. You know, species that we're driving to extinction through hunting or loss of habitat, whatever, cutting down every last tree to make another billboard to advertise for another subdivision. You know, the list just goes on. And it's hard for people to believe, it's hard for me to believe that not everybody sees it. But not everybody sees it, not everybody wants to see it. Just within the last week or two, I have tried contacting all of my previous graduate students, the, the graduate students I advised when they were in graduate school at the University of Arizona. And I haven't been on campus for a few years, but I still had very deep connections with these folks. We spent thousands of hours together in the field, in adverse circumstances, in various vehicles, going to scientific meetings, going to each other's houses for social events, that sort of thing. So these people were really important to me, and I was important to them. I am the reason in many cases, that they have the position they have, several professors and the like. Anyway, so I wanted to get in touch with them just so that I could tell them when we have the first ice-free Arctic Ocean, when that first happens, that tells us, based on the peer-reviewed literature, that we only have about a year to live. And I want to be able to have contact with these people so that I can tell them the worst of all possible news because I think they deserve to know, right? It, up until about 1970, medical doctors didn't tell their patients that they had a terminal disease. They just withheld that information. And now we would consider that horrible, right? That's just unethical. All the evidence indicates that this person has a terminal condition, they're gonna die in six weeks or six months or whatever then you have to tell them that as a medical doctor. But it wasn't that long ago that they didn't have to tell them that. In fact, it was considered bizarre if they were to tell them that. And so in similar vein, I'm trying to rely upon the work of others because I didn't discover the concept of laws of habitat for human animals until I left active service at the university. So I've been trying to inform people about that, and it's been horrifying. It's been devastating with a coordination defamation, coordinated defamation campaign that has destroyed first my public life 
and now my personal life where all these people I was very close to for a long time have just said, nope, don't want to have anything to do with you. You're the bad person. And I mean, yes, that's the whole thing. Like uh, that, and that is sort of somewhat the essence, I think, of what on some level, some scale, what people, if they want to continue thinking about this and pondering it, they're going to have to deal with. Like it could be loss of relationships. It could be less connection. It could be, you know, I guess a variety of things from mild to extreme horrifying right <laughs> um but absolutely. i mean I, absolutely i mean some some people actually appreciate knowing but then they know better than to tell other people right right because right. they know what happened to me mm-hmm. so they're not going to go down that road they're just going to keep it to themselves but they appreciate knowing in similar vein i think everybody deserves to know mm-hmm. and so that's why i continue down this path Ridiculous well, though it, I just yeah. thought of a comparison for you. You're kind of like, was it Copernicus who said who said the earth revolves around the sun? Was that Copernicus? So you're yes. like, you're like him, and you're like, no, like the earth revolves around the sun. And and everyone around you thinks you're a nutball, basically, right? Like, <laughs> right. And then and then and, they punish you to the point of what did they do? He had home arrest the rest of his life or something. Right. And well, right, he was under house arrest. For the rest of his life and he is he allegedly said uh, after he was convicted he allegedly said under his breath but it moves referring to the earth not being the center but actually moving around the sun mm-hmm. we don't know if that's true of course but it makes for a fine story and it's just i mean bruno giordano bruno was a predecessor of Copernicus. And he actually was saying the same thing. And he was thrown into a cave and brought out every now and then to be punished, to to relent. And he never did. So he was burned at the stake. And Copernicus almost certainly knew that and said, I'm not going to go down the Giordano Bruno path of having my life end, literally end, because of what the evidence says i could have taken a lesson but no some of us aren't as swift as others okay (laughs) well maybe i mean you had some uh you had some hope that people would actually get it i think uh, on a larger scale and it just wasn't gonna happen right and in fact i used to use that example of giordano bruno in my classes yeah and (laughs) And I never pointed out that it can destroy your life. I always told it like it was a good thing. <laughs> I guess anytime you're you're talking about a big paradigm shift, you're in sort of some dangerous territory, really. Because, um, you know, us humans, and this could be part of the maybe the acceptance of, you know, for people learning about this, but also being around people who don't care or reject it outright. So, I mean, we're cult- I think we're cultural beings in a large part like in a very large part programmed through whatever is the dominant narrative at the time we come upon into the earth right and um i think probably most people just sort of just take it they just sort of drink it like the kool-aid right and um and then they just stick with it because it's what feels comfortable what's it's sort of it, it makes sense in a way even though it's not backed by any evidence, sometimes it's just complete nonsense, like a lot of the religions, if you ask me, but people, they take it like it's real, right? Um, backed by nothing, backed by no evidence whatsoever, but that's what humans do. And um, I've had to learn how to accept a lot of things about humans too. It's just like, that's the way humans roll. That's what they do. And if you yes. haven't gone, if you haven't gone to like college or university where you've been seriously challenged about the way you look at things like I used to think that when I would um, be in my sociology and psychology classes I would come in there with all these preconceived notions right and so arrogant right and then like my professors it would be like a piece of glass and they would just smash it right and boom into like a million pieces and then I'd have to like go like oh shit like there's so much to consider here like it's not like as simple as I thought <laughs> And that would happen like over and over. 
So if you haven't been through that over and over where you're trying, you think, you know, everything, you think, you know, things, right. And then, and then they bring you the evidence and they ask you to look at um, uh, uh, opposing evidence, right. One, one side says this, one side says that. How do you do a synthesis of that? Have you tried to do a synthesis of opposing viewpoints? You know what I mean? Like if you oh, haven't yes. done that for, oh. if you haven't been exposed to that, and how many people actually do that? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's obviously far more comfortable to not believe that we can <clears throat> go extinct. Because if we go extinct, that means every one of us dies. That means I die. That's, you know, that's the primary concern of most people and probably justifiably so from an evolutionary perspective is my own death. Right? That means my genes don't carry on anymore. That means that it's not just me. It's all it's future generations of Guy McPherson's like we need a lot of that. And <clears throat> so that's a big deal. It's difficult for people to accept that this is the end of the road personally, much less for everybody else they know. Yeah, like, and yet, mm -hmm. yet there have been eight previous species in the genus Homo that have gone extinct, at least eight. This is at least the ninth mass extinction event in the last two billion years. So it's not as if something like this has never happened before. Mm -hmm. Things just like this have happened several times before whether we're talking about a mass extinction event or extinction of species that look a lot like us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, yeah, we don't, us, our species doesn't like looking at evidence, really. Like, we like convincing ourselves of a total BS and then ru running with that as far as we can. That seems to be what we like to do. You know, I, I hear or or read almost every day that life begins at the end of your comfort zone or something like that, right? Adventure begins at the end of your comfort zone. So people give the impression that they want to get out of their comfort zone. But I push people out of their comfort zones and they're not happy at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the sense of cognitive dissonance is uncomfortable. Right. And then you're and then you're facing all those feelings like of uh, 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 of life not being of life being short lived. Um, and I, 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 I recall very intimately feeling those feelings when I was first having discussions with you and feeling it would lead to some anger. And I'd be like and I would be wanting I was said this before I wanted to project that onto you like you're. I'd be like, God, you're making me feel this way, right? But actually, it was it was the information and the evidence that I didn't like, really, and I didn't like um, feeling the feelings that come with being presented with that information. Um, uh, so, I think you know we all need to understand that what's happening internally there as well. Like uh, a lot, a lot of us don't like feeling our emotions in our modern culture i think we've been trained to ignore a huge part of our human humanness especially the feeling side and then anytime someone draws you close to it you start to feel that kind of pissy feeling <laughs> right unless unless you practice that feeling and um and practice that feeling in certain subject domains even because this is this one again cuts right to the core because it suggests that we aren't going to have a full lifespan uh, potentially, um, right? right? And and that 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 makes feelings of existential fear arise in the body. And then you have to either what are you going to do with that? Are you going to run away? Are you going to call the people that sent, sent that show you the evidence? Are you going to call them names? Call them crazy? Or are you going to take a, a mature adult approach? And our society does not equip people that way. I'm convinced 100% as a therapist that our society does not. Is it okay if I quote something from The Matrix because it's one of my favorite shows? Of course. <laughs> uh, Morpheus in the very first uh, Matrix movie, is, which is my favorite, he says, he says, the Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around. What do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we're trying to save. But until we do these people are still part of that system 
and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged, and many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. <clears throat> it's really, yes. I, I dig, dig, really dig that quote. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, many of the ancient Stoics, the Greek Stoics, from roughly 2,000 years ago, said something like, or wrote something like, you don't respond to what somebody says. You respond to your feelings about what somebody says. So let's not confuse the two. And Marcus Aurelius in the Meditations pointed that out as well. That well, we, we, we don't like to take responsibility for our own reactions to the evidence we see and hear. So instead, we play the blame game. That can't really be happening because that would be uncomfortable for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I might have to. I might have to feel something I don't want to feel. Wanna... Exactly. We're all about <laughs> comfort in this society. <laughs> well, I would say it's uh, even bigger than that. Like uh, I think we are, and I think you've mentioned this in a lot of your classes. We are set up for dependence. Really, like. Um, we we learn to become dependent on the money system. We can't survive without it. Mm. I, I know that I've never learned any other way to survive. <clears throat> All I know is get money, go to the store, get stuff, live. Like I don't I've never learned how to hunt. I've never learned like anything like in this in the bush, right? Nothing. I was a city boy, right? And so you, you get a job, you get money, you go to the store and, and then you go home and eat it. That's it. That's my that's been my life, and so I know that I'm stunted and also on a survival level, like that way, right? And but it's more than that. It's more. It's we're emotionally stunted too, because mental health is not a high priority subject. It's just not. Right. If it was, and people were like um, uh, well educated and had capacity that way, people like me, like thousands of therapists, maybe millions, like we wouldn't. We're all busy, <laughs> like we. Every, People struggle in it uh, with mental health, it, and it comes down to a lot of not knowing how to live in a human body, not knowing how to deal with the emotions, and having all kinds of ways to try and avoid that part of yourself, right? And um, and I guess I'm even extra disgusted because I think I think that that religion reinforces this dependence concept because they say if you they say you need to admit that you are a hundred percent dependent on this this imaginary savior figure and if you don't admit that dependence then you're not going to make it after you're dead like something or something bad will happen right i know all different religions have their version of right the, the wackadoo but like um <laughs> but i mean it encourages dependence too right like and they encourage us to have to be in debt they like to take out a mortgage to 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 make payments on a car like who how many people like almost everybody does that right right in fact in the early 1990s when i was on the university of arizona campus i would talk <laughs> with my graduate students about ideas that i thought were worthy of discussion and one of them was developing a declaration of interdependence right so we we in this country we all know about the declaration of independence but what I was trying to get across was the idea that we are actually interdependent upon each other and upon a living planet. So let's write a declaration of interdependence to pursue that idea. One of my first PhD students landed a tenure track job at the University of Tennessee. He went there and was going to offer it as a seminar, but not enough people signed up for it. Which tells me pretty much everything I need to know about that idea. <laughs> Nobody, nobody on this very large campus thought it was a good idea to talk about our interdependence <laughs> because mm -hmm. it probably doesn't exist from their perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, what a world. the idea! The uh, it, it's it's dissonant with the American dream, is it? Inter Absolutely, yes. The old pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We can do anything as individuals. That idea, which of course is nonsense. It's just afflicted the entire society here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
you know, and I have to wonder if uh, the these um, these narratives and these concepts about American dream, and even the even the religious narratives, like they seem to overlap and harmonize with each other. It almost seems to me, like call me crazy guy, but I think it's just a big imperialistic strategy. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, the Americans were like, you know, the British, they almost conquered the whole world, you know, like we could, we could do it, you know, if we have the right, right. tools, if we have right. the right tool, tools and mechanisms in place, we could conquer everything and everybody and, and we could colonize the whole damn thing. Like, I don't know. Is that crazy? <laughs> uh, you told me yourself that that's not a term in the, in the, the field. <laughs> Yeah, we just use it <laughs> informally. You know? <laughs> you know this this idea, the American dream, does not mean what it used to mean. In my first book length work of social criticism, Killing the Natives, I describe who came up with the idea. I'm not going to come up with it off the top of my head because that book was written a long time ago, and. He was pointing out that the American dream is and can be the idea that we all help those who need help the most. The American dream really is that everybody lives together in this country and acts as if we are all one. And somehow along the way, it got bastardized into this idea that it means a two-car garage and the big house and the kids going to school and blah blah nonsense right so mm -hmm. that it has become the dream that results when everybody lives exactly the same way mm -hmm. yeah i think it has i mean is that when uh some of the big corporate uh they tried to co-opt some of these um uh, original ideas about what it means to be oh. American. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. After World War II, there was an unbelievably coordinated attempt by the United States government to, working alongside the petroleum companies and the automobile companies to develop the interstate highway system under the auspices of defense, national defense, to create a world in which essentially everybody lived in suburbs so when you have suburbs in the interstate highway system you're 90 percent of the way done to getting everybody to think exactly the same way to transform the american dream from something that everybody helps each other to something that has everybody scrambling like crabs in a bucket knocking off whoever gets to to the top right oh so, i mean um Projects like yours that you've done for your life and your life's work, I mean, it's really a, a it's a resistance to that sort of um, type of thinking. And um, of course, I guess would lead to all these consequences for you, right? Um, yeah, sad, yeah. Sadly. Um, but, um, you know, I guess we could see still where this leads, which is part of the in interesting part of participating as well. Um, you know, you're still here. I'm still here. Right. And right. Uh, we're still talking about this. And um, um, you never know who hears, I guess, some of the things that we say and some of the point blank challenges that we make to people who probably couldn't care less, I guess. Right. <laughs> or, right. or or pur and, purposefully ignore this stuff. Right. And, and almost every week somebody writes to me and says, I just discovered your work and I think it's amazing. Please keep going. And doesn't exactly counterbalance the 3,000 email messages I receive every day calling me names, but whatever. Well, I, I guess all those, those are all the people that haven't learned how to manage their emotions yet. So they're just going to attack you instead of learn how right. to grow up. Instead of learn how right. to grow up, right? I, I'll just attack them through an email. You Growing know, up uh, is hard. I've never been a fan. I don't encourage anybody to do that, it's, but it's a difficult maybe thing. other people... <laughs> And the thing is, I don't even think most of us realize that we haven't. Like, I didn't know that I wasn't fully grown in my mid-30s and I had to do all this extra growing and deal with parts of my brain that I didn't know were big issues. It's like, wow, okay, so I have to do all this growing. 
Um, but it's, I mean, it's not just people with BPD who have extraordinarily sensitive emotional centers. It's, 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 it's uh, people with regular neurology as well. They still need to grow and they haven't. Right. No, um, I, I think it's everybody in the society, everybody in this society has been fed the same line that we all live the same way. And that's normal that mm -hmm. we all like the same things because that's normal. And we dislike the same things because those don't fit in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you, when you have this stuff hammered into you from birth, it's hard to even think about living differently. Right. And people are, I think kind of, there's two words they probably not want to hear is cowardly and lazy. Um, you have to be brave to broach this subject because you're putting your reputation on the line. You know, people might think you're just a, a nutball, whatever, or a fringe, whatever, extremist, whatever, like they'll come up with some label. So if you're going to talk about this openly, you're willingly re risking your reputation. So people will be cowardly like, no, I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm not going to make any waves. I'm just going to like try and blend in so that I don't get attacked in any way and I can make sure that I can keep all my privileges. I don't want to lose my privileges. Right? <laughs> I don't want to sacrifice my privileges by being honest. No right. way. Right. Right. And, and I don't I don't want to have to think deeper than I do every day. I just want to go to work and come home. <laughs> right. Have a beer while I watch television. That's the American <laughs> dream. The American dream is Bud Light and NFL. Football. <laughs> yeah don't think any more than you need to right like this kind of thing like just you know i mean in a lot of these narratives they let you off the thinking hook i think like if you especially like church they just say well it's all going to be solved by this big person so you don't need to think about it just live your life go to work make as much money as you can get as many things as you can enjoy your life right and, and don't worry don't worry about it and live in a prescribed manner live like <laughs> this yeah yeah uh live like we have suggested is the best through our advertising right get all right. Of these and, and short-term fixes right and there's and there's all there's this long list of things that we can't do because society says those are bad things to do you know right. it wasn't that long ago for example when smoking weed was illegal you'd actually get put in prison for it you still can if you're black in the united states and you certainly can be let out of prison for those crimes which are no longer crimes and now people are actually beginning to recognize that there might be some medicinal use to plants that are found in nature and you know i'm i'm not a fan or anything I, i've tried smoking weed a couple of times and that's all i need <laughs> doesn't do good things for me but i don't think it's a horrible thing for other people i think that's a it's a heck of a lot better than drinking alcohol smoking cigarettes for example and those are legal right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pretty much everywhere mm -hmm. uh, no, yeah it's strange i mean uh yeah some of the, some of the uh, plants can be very medicinal for certain conditions and um, you know, I'm, I'm glad here in Canada that's that that's legalized that way. Um, so I guess I was just going to lastly kind of point out, like, even if you're, um, you know, invested in this subject and and you're, you know, frustrated that people are um, like locked in their mentality, um, I think you can still get to a place where it's like um, uh, you don't have to like fight reality, you know. Uh, like reality is actually one of the if you read any books from byron katie she talks yes um, she has a book called loving what is and she's all about reality acceptance uh so that i mean reading any of her work might help you to uh, deal with that kind of subject as well like and um i mean i've really just come to terms that like uh you know humans they get indoctrinated into their narratives they even get addicted i think to their narratives um, they don't like to feel feelings in a lot of cases and challenging your narratives brings up uncomfortable feelings. So why would you want to challenge your narrative if you would have to feel? So, well, and Dr. You know. Dr. Gabor Mate, who 
everybody knows if you've been on YouTube for more than about 15 minutes, right? And he has these really wise things to say. His mm -hmm. response to palliative care or hospice care is two words, accepting inevitability. We have to accept the inevitable. Or we can't move on with our lives. Mm -hmm. If we're going to live in a dream world, hoping for something to happen, wishing for something to come true, what kind of life is that? <laughs> Nobody's going to fix this for you. No, no. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you do need to come to terms. And actually, early in, early in my practice at the clinic I'm in now, I was really frustrated when people wouldn't come back. Like, I'd be like, what, what? Don't they want to learn? Like, don't they want to grow? Like, why aren't they here? And I mean, I no, they, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there could be lots of reasons they don't come back to see me or anyone, I guess. But like, I, my colleagues said to me, and this will ever stick in my brain. They said, they said, are you in a free country, Peter? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Uh, sort of, <laughs> but people are, they were saying people are free to be, they can be what they want to be. Like they can be deluded. They can be, they can stay depressed. They can, they can do whatever they want with their health, right? They can become totally, extremely right. obese. They can become anorexic. They can, they can self-harm. I mean, like, you don't have to be healthy. And uh, I think if you if you really want to deal with this subject, you have to be a person that's kind of interested in that learning how to be okay in, in your mind and body. And you don't have to, I guess, you know, in most societies, you can stay as narrow minded and deluded and, and, and magical thinking as you like, you don't have to accept any of the evidence. And it's, I guess that's reality. It's hard for me to like, embrace that because i want people to be healthy right but i just i can't have what i want <laughs> <laughs> yes we can't force people to learn what they don't want to learn we can like especially when it comes to health like you, you can't make somebody be healthy I right mean, we can force you're not them gonna into, uh... you're not gonna get me off twizzlers and ice cream <laughs> i don't care how bad you say it is for uh, yeah yeah We'll talk about all the evidence and the chemicals. And right. And I know, I know this is terrible, right? Twizzlers and ice cream is like the worst diet you can possibly have. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> you have that three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I try to have it a little more often than that. Oh, okay. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah I used to, however, have a bowl of ice cream after each of the three regular meals per day. And then on Sundays, I would have a big bowl in the afternoon while mm -hmm. I was watching. So I was I was the model American, really, on the path to becoming <laughs> addicted to high fructose corn syrup <laughs> and television. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm no saint either. I mean, I have lots of bad habits too. I, you know, and that's part of accepting yourself too. We're a mixed bag of, you know, things and we're, Part of us is probably trying to improve and other parts are, you know, a little bit more deviant, whatever. But um, so I guess like, yeah, you, you, to be OK with this truly within all the people around you, um, you need to accept humans as they are. Um, which is, um, I don't know, they're, they're, they're easily programmed. They're kind of cowardly. They're kind of lazy. Um, yeah. So they're, they don't, they're they don't like, like us. To, they don't like to think very much. And. I mean, I, I I fall into those things too. Um, I think my curiosity has spiked some intense work in the other direction at times. But I mean, I'm just human too, I guess you know. And um, yeah, if that's what humans do, that's how we roll. Then we have to accept the inevitable, I guess, because that's that's who we are, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, Nietzsche said it best through the title of his book: "We're all too human." <laughs> Yes. Yeah. But All you can find, you can uh, find some peace actually in accepting the realities. Like if you really dig down and accept who we are, I think you can be like, okay, it's just who we are. Like when I was telling you, right. when I was at my relative's lake lot there and I was just like, that's just what humans, that's, that's what they do in this, in this um, time and place in history, they all want a piece of the pie. They're, right. uh, they're, they're almost everybody doesn't think about this subject. They're just going to be individualistic and materialistic, and they're going to go for their, they're going to go for their big win. So, 
Did, that did I tell you about that, my, that leads us in the, that direction? Did I tell you about my trip to the endodontist? No. So the endodontist is the dentist that the regular dentist sends you to when things are really bad, right? Like it looks like you're going to need root canals and, and you're going to need your whole mouth replaced with something else, whatever. So I went to an endodontist. Uh, I think it was earlier this week. I must have been last week, whatever. Anyway, and he takes a look around, probes around a little bit and says, why are you here? And I said, because the, the dentist said that things were really screwed up, like I'm going to need root canals. And he said, you don't need a root canal. Why are you here? This fine. This is fine. They said that 2 and 31, which are our teeth here and here, I think. He said, that's what they said was wrong, but there's nothing there. Get out of here. And I'm like, do you not know how the dentistry profession works? It's like <laughs> these people are making a, a gob of money, so they send me someplace else so that you make a gob of money too. And so I paid this guy $185 and spent two and a half hours of my time to find out that I'm fine. Hmm. Do you curious. charge people to 180? Do you charge people 185 dollars to tell them they're fine? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I don't charge people at all. It's all covered in our in our benefit system. So that's my job. I don't have to collect money. So <laughs> so they can find out for free that they're fine. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was crazy, and that's the world we occupy, I guess. And mm -hmm. and I, I'm getting a different dentist, by the way. Oh, who, okay. Yeah. Who won't send me on my way for two and a half hours to get <laughs> something done I don't need done? It was a false flag operation for teeth. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is fine as long as it's not my teeth. Right, right. But it costs you time and money. That was that's kind of annoying. Oh people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's wrap this up. Do you have any final comment or comments? Oh, sure. Uh... So yeah, thanks for everybody for um, checking out the free BPD course at freebpdcourse.com. Uh, we have had some registrations and um, and I can see that some people are actually engaging the material, which is really nice. Um, it's the most meaningful thing for me is to have gone through my, my mental health challenges and then tried to figure it out and share it and then to have other people benefit in some way. Um, that's where I get like my kicks in life is to, I don't know that there's some meaning to the suffering, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, if, if um, you're needing any instruction or guidance or support, that course is there available for anybody to access at that uh, uh, site. And that guy will place the link in the comments below and maybe on the screen here. Um, so thanks for checking that out. And if you do have any feedback for me or even just that it's helping, please let me know. Um, there is um, a link to my email in my biography, mini biography at the bottom of freebpdcourse.com. Excellent. That's great. And I know several people have already contacted you and have begun the course. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. And we're going to take a week off next week because I'm going camping with friends. And so I know I said that at the beginning, but I wanted to say it here at the end, too. I encourage everybody to take a look at Peter's freebpdcourse.com. And I strongly suspect it, it can help all of us. And it, it certainly can't hurt. So <laughs> thanks, everybody. Look forward to doing this in another couple of weeks. Sounds good. See you guys.